Hey, I'm Melissa. I'm Jam. And I'm a chemist. And I'm not. And welcome to Chemistry for Your Life. The podcast helps you understand the chemistry of your everyday life. Okay, Jam, before we get into today's chemistry lesson, I need to get a little background info. Okay. Can you name some things that are made of rubber? Things that are made of rubber, like household objects? Anything. What can you think of? Like plunger. Okay. First thought for some reason. Rubber ball. Rubber ball. Kids toy kind of thing. Um, I mean, there's got to be more than that. There's definitely more than that. Um, <laughs> some <laughs> other things I thought of are uh, tires on cars. Oh, duh. Totally. Yep. I also put bouncy ball soles of shoes sometimes. Yes, yes, yes. Totally. Um, latex gloves. Oh, right. Rubber gloves. Uh-huh. Totally. And balloons are sometimes made of rubber. Yes, totally. Okay, so you've got that, all those things, you can picture them? Yes, I can picture them in my head. So what do you think those things are made of? Like, obviously they're made of rubber, but what is it? Yeah, I don't know if I know. I feel like rubber and silicon and flexible plastics and all that probably blend together in my head. Like, I'm probably not, Yep. I bet I wouldn't really know what's actually what. Yeah. Most of the time. But I know that there's a tree, it's a yep. rubber tree. Mm -hmm. so. I had a similar experience to you. Okay. So, and then I asked Mason, my husband, engineer. So he had a similar um, response as me, where we all kind of were like, yeah, what is rubber versus silicone versus plastic? Uh huh. Uh huh. And that's kind of where this started. Um, our patron, Avishai B, he's a friend of ours, reaches out pretty consistently. And he was asking about a material called silicone rubber. And mm -hmm. I realized that before I could talk about that, I needed to talk about silicone and rubber. Ah. So today we're okay. going to talk about what even is rubber. Okay. Okay. And just a warning to some parents and a fun, exciting thing for you. If you're currently listening with kids, we are going to talk about contraceptives towards the end of the episode as part of our fun facts. Okay. But for the most part, we'll avoid it. Okay. Got it. Okay, so here's a little background info, and then we'll dive deeper into the chemistry lesson. Okay. Okay, this seems unrelated, but have you ever cut into a dandelion or another flower or maybe even a piece of lettuce and it oozes like white stuff? I think I have experienced this on the dandelion side, but I don't know mm -hmm. about lettuce. That's okay if you have it on the lettuce, but you have experienced it on the dandelion I th side. I think so. Okay, that liquid is latex. <laughs> oh, okay. Which is confusing because I thought of latex as like the stuff on gloves. Yeah. But latex is a liquid that is emitted by trees and flower flowering plants. It's about 10% of flowering plants will emit this liquid whenever it's wounded or broken as a defense mechanism. Okay. So, Typically, it'll heal the wound. It's thought that possibly it, you know, any kind of insects that will hurt it, that it might be a defense mechanism against those. Okay. Um, and dandelions do it. So as soon as I was like, oh, dandelions, I've definitely seen that milky stuff come out of dandelions. Like we played with them a lot when we were little kids. But more commonly, uh, the rubber tree, which is, I'll try to say this, but I'll probably get it wrong. Hevia brazilianus. Okay. Question mark. Not a biologist, mm -hmm. period. <laughs> um, <laughs> so all these plants will emit this liquid called latex. Okay. And in the liquid, it has water, proteins, carbohydrates, but most importantly, a polymer. Okay. And just a quick review. We've talked about polymers a lot before, but a polymer is a large molecule made up of a bunch of smaller molecules. In this case, it has one small molecule that's repeating. It's not like a variety, like ABC, different molecules, ABC, ABC, ABC. This one's just one. So just like A, 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 A. Same thing repeating over and over. Ah. Oh, no. <laughs> I wouldn't have even gotten that was a joke if you had it, <laughs> if you hadn't made that face. Um, so the uh, this molecule is called 2-methyl-1,3-butadiene. If anyone's an organic chemistry student, that 
it's probably the only person it'll mean anything to. <laughs> you can pause and see how much you remember from OCHEM. But essentially, it's carbons. There are some double bonds. That's all you really need to know. Okay. Um, it's non, not really polar. It, um, well, I guess it has a little bit of polarity, but it, it's similar in structure as a hydrocarbon to like oils because okay. just carbons and hydrogens are the primary thing. So it doesn't have a huge polarity and it's relatively nonpolar. Okay. Okay. And, um, I was going to say that, you know, we have, we've talked about how polymers are small molecules made up, or large molecules made up of several smaller molecules. Mm -hmm. Typically this polymer has between 1500 and 15,000 units of that molecule. Wow. So that's the numbers that we're talking about. Okay. Okay. So that's latex. And I'm betting you're wondering, what does that have to do with rubber and gloves? Because that's just a liquid with a polymer in it. Right. Well, that polymer is the key to rubber. Okay. That polymer is called natural rubber, but it's also called isoprene. Okay. And essentially, you're going to isolate that polymer from the latex uh, suspension of the plant. So the milky liquid is a suspension, which means it has these polymers floating in it. And similar to the way that uh, people collect maple syrup, they can tap it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, get the latex to come out. Yeah. And they'll take that fraction and use that, that like, um, I guess fraction is not a good word. They'll take like a, we'll say a container of that latex and isolate the polymer from within it. Got it. So uh, the polymer is called polyisoprene. The individual monomer is called isoprene. So poly, many, many isoprene. Okay. 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 So they tap it, they get the liquid out, and then um, they isolate that polymer to be used in rubber. Okay. Before we talk about how they do that, I always think it's important to acknowledge indigenous knowledge and to recognize that a lot of times indigenous communities knew about things before Western science really did. And in this case, that's true. A lot of um, indigenous populations in the South and Central Americas used latex to waterproof their clothes mm. and shoes. And they even made rubber balls that were used in games across Central America and South wow, America. That's awesome. I know. Isn't that so cool? Yeah. I'm like, rubber has been around for so long. Yeah, seriously. So what Western science, what modern uh, manufacturer does is they take that latex suspension. They treat it to keep bacterial growth out because it's from a plant. Right. So can be bacteria supported in that environment. And then they will separate the polymer out using a centrifuge. Have you ever gotten to use a centrifuge? No, but you've described it to me before. It's like, they. I think they can have different sizes of them, but the ones that we use a lab in the lab a lot are like, looks like a countertop appliance, almost like a fat, short air fryer. Uh -huh. <laughs> and you can open the lid and there's a bunch of little slots for you to put like test tubes in. Yeah. And they'll spin really, really fast. And through that spinning, the gravity acts on them and um, maybe the centrifugal force. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't do physics, <laughs> but it'll separate out um, like solids from the liquid. It kind of like gets um, different fractions is usually what we'll call it. Uh-huh. And so they'll use that to concentrate the isoprene down from being about the 25 to 40% isoprene within the latex suspension to 60% of isoprene within or polyisoprene within the latex suspension. Okay. So you have a much higher concentration of the polymer, the natural rubber polymer, um, concentrated down. Okay. And that is essentially what you'll use to make things like gloves. Mm. So that it's like a liquid type polymer or it's in the suspension. They'll treat it with different chemicals and you can like dip molds into it to make gloves, for example. Um, and they'll usually wash it to try to get anything other than the polymer that's soluble in water out. So they dip a mold in and then take it out. And so there's like a really thin layer mm -hmm. and then it dries and becomes... So I think they heat it. Um, there, I wasn't incredibly clear on the dipping process. Okay. 
Just that there's a process they can dip it and they can heat it so that it's not the liquid anymore. And then they sometimes will coat it in a slurry to get that powder on it to keep it from being too sticky. Slurry. One of those great words. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, but that's not your main lesson. So okay, that's kind okay. of like an aside is that they have this more like um, highly concentrated in liquid and they'll go through like a manufacturer processing where they usually use dipping, but it's primarily in that state, the original polyisoprene from the tree rubber state. Okay. And when it's in that state, if you heat it up, it can melt. And if it gets cold, it gets solid. Like most things that are at room temperature, heated up, they get more liquidy. If you cool them down, they get more solid. Okay. So that's your natural rubber, or sometimes that's called latex. So a latex glove would be made of that. Other things you can think of made of latex come from that. Catheters, balloons, they're often in that phase of latex. Okay. Okay. But still that's very different than the rubber of like car tires. Right. Like a rubber glove feels really different than a car tire. Which specifically car tires, I don't know. I don't know more details than this really, but I know that they specifically are vulcanized, Mm. which is, I think makes a big difference. It does make a big difference. But I don't remember what that is. I remember learning about that in science one time. That's your big chemistry lesson for today. Ah. So up till now, we had a lot of background information, and Uh now we get into how that weird latex polymer that makes gloves and balloons turns into anything like a car tire. Got it. It's way tougher and hardy and all that stuff. Doesn't really move. Doesn't really flow when it gets heated up. It's totally different. Right, right. So this is your big chemistry lesson. So everything up to this point was just kind of like, here's a little background on what latex is and where it comes from. And then now we're going to talk about how that turns into essentially vulcanized rubber. Forget everything you know about (laughs) that I just said. No, don't forget it. (laughs) Oh, (laughs) I saw this video the other day that it was like, it was like, forget everything you know. It was like the beginning of a recipe or something like that. But then the guy watching it just goes like, (laughs) like he he has an an expression and his his face just slowly goes, because like, like he just <laughs> forgot, for literally forgot everything he knew. <laughs> it was like one of those things where it's like, you got to really hold on for the joke to land. And also his ability to do a face that looks like he forgot everything was like definitely the punchline. You know? <laughs> that reminds me of like, there's an idea in knowledge that like, oh, we start from a blank slate of this thing, but uh-huh. nobody really starts from a blank sta- slate. They take right. in knowledge from other places yeah. And then you use new knowledge to decide if you're going to keep the knowledge you got or not. Right. Right. And um, so I think that that's funny on a different, on a, <laughs> on a, from an academic <laughs> point, that's like hitting on a theory of knowledge. So that's great. Good job. <laughs> okay. Okay. So let's go back to our original, one of our original analogies that we ever used for polymers, which is beaded necklaces. Oh yeah. Okay. So like imagine, you know, Mardi Gras beads or pearls, something that's just like a repeating unit sort of strung together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we normally have in our latex polymer is a bunch of those polymers that are, they're sort of stuck together. Like maybe they've twisted around each other a little bit in the coagulation phase where they come together and they make that glove type texture. Uh But they're not really stuck together. So imagine it like sort of just like a mass of you took a bunch of Mardi Gras beads or you took a bunch of pearl necklaces and you threw them on the ground. Okay. And they're there and they might get tangled up a little bit. So they're kind of in a group, but they're not really connected to each other. They're each sort of an independent unit. Now imagine if you took something like pipe cleaners or zip ties and you just started making connections between those different necklaces. Right. Okay. That would change the properties of them a lot, right? Yeah. You wouldn't be able to separate them out as much. Right. You wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't probably flow away from each other if you heated them up. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's sort of a different, (laughs) I'm going back into my, away from my analogy. That's essentially what happens to vulcanized rubber. Okay. So all the individual polymers are the polyisoprene that already exist. Right. And if you add sulfur to that, I'm sure there's a more complicated chemical process, but sulfur is the big deal. If you add sulfur to that, you can make what they call cross links. 
Okay. Which are essentially little bridges or little bond chains of atoms that force those polymers to now be connected to each other. Okay. It's similar to what happens in curly hair. Mm. So we've talked about it on, on the episode where we talked about hair before. So you have these cross links that will start to hold the polymers in place that are starting to make that mass of beads or necklaces into one. Okay. And you can imagine if you have more cross links, then you would get those to be closer and closer together and more tightly held. Mm -hmm. But if you have less cross links, there's still some wiggle room. Like you can stretch out the beads, but they'll come back together kind of right, thing. Right, right. That's essentially vulcanized rubber. You take polyisoprene polymers. You add sulfur, which by itself isn't very good at cross-linking, so you have to do some other chemical stuff to it, but sulfur's the main guy. Okay. And you make sulfur bridges or sulfur cross-links that hold these polymers together in a really rigid way. Okay. And so we have like a sturdy rubber now. Okay. And that is your vulcanized rubber. Interesting. But even within your vulcanized rubber, you have like a range. You know, rubber bands, they have less cross links and they're more easily spread and snap back together. Whereas probably like something like a tire has more cross links. So it is losing its elasticity a little bit at that right. time. Right. Okay. So that's how you get vulcanized rubber. That is so crazy. And also I feel like somewhere in there, if you had really made me guess, I might have guessed sulfur because I feel like that that little tidbit is probably all I ever learned. Like, mm. hey, they figured out vulcanizing rubber, they use sulfur to do it, but they probably never explained deeper than that. Yeah, like but what the sulfur does. Somehow as soon as you said that, it was like, oh yeah, that does sound kind of right. Like, mm -hmm. like I had been told that at one point, but that was it. And burning rubber smells bad, so there's probably sulfur in it. Right, right. You know? Dang, interesting. The I more know. cross links, more, more kind of rigid, less elasticity to it. Mm -hmm. Interesting. And also the lengths of carbon or of sulfur atoms, you can have between like one and eight sulfur atoms to make those cross links. Okay. So the shorter cross links are more heat resistant. So I'm, and tires are very heat resistant. Yeah, gotta but be. the longer cross links are uh, more elastic. And okay. then the more cross links make it more stable as well. Okay. Interesting. I know. Man, that is nuts. I got so excited that I stopped looking at my notes. So let me real quick make sure I covered everything that I wanted to cover. Yes, I think I did. Okay. Um, yep, I think so. The only other thing is a unique thing about rubber because of those cross links holding the polymer together is as it heats up and the energy is put in, gets smaller and condenses ah. instead of flowing more. So that's another thing that the cross-linking does that sets it apart from its original polymer state is those cross-links make it so that where, as it heats up, it's it gets almost more stable. It like shrinks up instead of heating up and flowing out. Okay, interesting. So it would be maybe you could have a smaller amount of it in terms of like what we could see with our eyes, but it might be might weigh more could be more dense. So say you compared it to like a slightly less cross-linked version. Yeah, but it's less about the density and more about the fact that because that happens, it can be used in really high heat environments like cars. Got it. So there's like rubber belts in cars mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that they don't melt and deform and mess up because as they get applied to heat, they just stay sturdy oh i see they gotcha. almost get sturdier you know yeah interesting. And because they're that elastic they and they are heat resistant they don't deform so rubber is a big reason well vulcanized rubber is a big reason why we can have cars wow that is crazy now here's another question that we're all wondering how connected is vulcanizing rubber to the vulcan people i have no idea yeah i've i don't know why it's called that Interesting. In all the little videos I watched, they were like, good year for the tires, accidentally or on purpose, <laughs> not clear, accidentally dumped sulfur and 
this latex together and it made a cool thing. And that's how that is so funny. We made, but I don't know if that's really true because also sulfur by itself isn't the best crosslinker. Like you have to have other things that help it, Mm. but maybe if it, you let it go long enough, but apparently he was like, and then it made this really hard rubbery texture on my stove. And that's how I guessed it. Yeah. But he says it was on purpose. Right. And I also feel like it's one of those things where the story could be like, (laughs) I think they kind of want to cover up like, yeah, we were illegally dumping byproducts of uh, <laughs> yeah, who knows? Beer, things we were doing and we <laughs> happened to dump a bunch of sulfur and a bunch of latex together into a big old, into a canyon or something like that and do a ditch. And we came back later and we're like, Hey, <laughs> he said it was on his stove and that it was on purpose. But yeah, listen, this is just, if it's an accident, this is one more instance where Accidents aren't terrible and it's okay to make accidents. Just pay attention to what happens afterwards. Right. Right. So that's how rubber works. I guess the difference between an accident and science would be like, are you trying to then like, like observe and replicate (laughs) and that kind of thing? Like, are you going to end up continuing to follow the scientific method or you know, leave it as an accident. Yeah. And (laughs) did your accident fail or did you figure out what it was? That's the difference between science or... Right. Did you give up after the accident or did you observe it? Yeah, it was an accident all the way up until he said, hey, this is vulcanized. <laughs> now, now it's science. <laughs> yeah, so in all the videos, they didn't explain the vulcanization they or why it's called vulcanized, but they... Did they say when-ish that happened? I mean, not, not, not that you need to remember that. But. Yes, they did, but I don't remember, but I bet I could pull it up pretty quickly because I have all of my little references right here. My guess is that that there's no way it happened after Star Trek already existed, but it'd be so cool if it was... 1839 by Charles Goodyear after whom the tire company was named. And this is from Chemistry World, which is the Royal Society of Chemistry, which is in Europe, and so they spell tire with a Y. Wow. Do they still spell it that way? I don't know. Or was it like that was how it was? No, I think they still spell it that way. Wow. They also, anytime we use like analyze or vulcanize, they use an S instead of a Z. Right, right. Because I submit to that magazine or that like, uh, it's not a magazine. I submit to the peer reviewed journal that's a part of that. Uh-huh. Chemistry World is the magazine associated with it. And they have like a um, a template. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the template will autocorrect my Zs to Ss. Oh, interesting. <laughs> What's funny too is that we we mostly did that. But we didn't, we were a little choosy. Like for instance, advertisement, we obviously pronounce it differently than UK, uh-huh. our UK friends, but we still kept the S. We didn't, we didn't swap that one to a Z. Like what's the deal with that? Like we can't even, we're not even consistent with our stuff. English is a confusing language. I honestly feel bad for people learning English, oh, yeah. but that's a tangent. A hundred percent. And we're going to get back on topic. Okay. Deal. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> I think that that's everything, but I wanted you to try to explain back to me the process of polymer crosslinking. Okay. Got it. So when you initially, I'm going to use your analogy, it was helpful. And it's the only way I can think of it in my brain now. Okay. So each of these polymer units is like a bead, of, a necklace, necklace mm-hmm. made of beads. And so you've got a bunch of them. And in the case of the non-vulcanized latex rubber stuff, mm-hmm. we've just got these, a bunch of these polymers, but they kind of tangle themselves together it makes just enough of a structure. We can do some stuff, very elastic, very flexible, all that kind of stuff, but not, um, but it just kind of happens to tangle that way. Yeah. Doesn't need a ton of help. Doesn't need us to add a bunch of stuff into it. Does that naturally, we can control it by adding agents to make it go faster or keep it from happening. Okay. But it'll also happen on its own. Okay. And that's Got how it. it heals the trees up. Got it. So we end up if we want to achieve a different result and have those necklaces be create more of a rigid structure mm-hmm. um, we need to actually connect them together yes in some way instead of just hoping that they kind of tangle together on their own the beads get a little twisted or whatever we want them to actually get connected yes and so it'd be almost like um so it wouldn't be perfect because it's made of the same material. But if you have a chain, it's like a chain necklace mm-hmm. and you get, you know, that little link at the end of the chain that links it to itself. Oh yeah. Or whatever, like that's like a different little shape. What if it's like you have these perfect loops of, of chain, 
but then the the link things are actually the sulfur mm. and they can link from one to another instead of to itself i think that that is it makes a little bit of sense but the one thing it doesn't capture is the links happen all over not like at a specific place right so I'm it could saying be like in the middle or yeah i'm saying instead of closing its own chain if you have a link like that that clicks chains together so it like does side to side yeah. it does end to end it does top of one to middle of another all over the place yeah yep okay yeah, yeah. something like that same thing as a pipe cleaner but basically you need to connect them in a way where there's where they really are pretty stuck together yeah and especially if you do that in more than one place and multiple places across, you know, in each, if each polymer loop or chain or necklace is connected to other ones in multiple places, it gets yep. more and more of this structure mm-hmm. um, to it, which makes it more stable and less elastic y, mm-hmm. more rigid. And also just more durable, it sounds like too. Yeah. And in the uh, the chemical level, in this case, we it's it needs human interference for this to happen. And the our our friend Goodyear figured out that sulfur mm-hmm. was a good choice. Sulfur's the chain. The chain. It's the mm-hmm. thing. the The chain. The pipe cleaner. The whatever added in that does that. And links them together. Yep. And even though we've got essentially the same polymer that's making up a huge percentage of this substance, because of that structural change, change it makes for really different applications, yeah. including tires and stuff like that, and makes it way more heat resistant. Yep. Am I missing anything there? I don't think you're missing anything. The one thing I was going to say is I think probably the best analogy for sulfur is probably something like zip ties because you can make them longer or shorter Mm. and we didn't quite capture that in the chain link yeah okay and we didn't quite capture that in the chain link even the pipe cleaners i guess you could make shorter or longer i was trying to think if there's anything else even just tying them with a string Mm -hmm. because if they're longer chains they can move around more yeah and you would get that if you made a bigger loop with a zip tie than a tight tight loop with a zip tie is the sulfur making a loop also or no, is it it's just a bridge. To yeah. bridge. Okay, okay. So that does make the the zip tie less good of an analogy. But it but the fact that you can make it longer or shorter, yeah, okay. So and that changes the structure of it as well, making yeah. the sulfur longer or shorter. It just changes the properties, yeah. Okay. So if it's longer, does that make it more elastic or less? Yes. So um Shorter crosslinks are more heat resistant and longer crosslinks are more elastic. That's okay. what I copied from the Royal Society of Chemistries. They did a, a really good short podcast about this, but they don't go into some of the, um, like, oh, if you don't know what a polymer or crosslink right, is. Right. Yeah. But it is really good. Like with yeah. this background information, you could go listen to it and get a lot out of it, even that I didn't talk about. I I love this because... It actually, once you get into it, it's actually intuitive. You really think about what if I did have a bunch of these mm-hmm. sort of loops? And what if I did have some that were linked together with a really short connector, yeah. a little really short bridge? I have a, what if I had some that were connected with a really long bridge and the ways that it would maybe affect the way it moves and stuff. And so I, I feel like there's some times where the way that these things happen at the molecular level. Mm-hmm. It actually doesn't necessarily make an intuitive change yeah. to us. But in this case, I love it because it's like, I was, I'm, it's going to be easy for me to remember because having a shorter bridge feels intuitive. They would make a more rigid, more yeah. heat resistant, mm-hmm. less elastic structure. Yep. Having a longer bridge seems like it would have more room Lucy, yeah. to be elastic and stuff. So I it like this a lot. It feels like, this is a kid's toy. Like we're one <laughs> step away. I'm like, connects is kind of similar right. where the longer ones are weaker and easier to break, but those short ones they are like, you could step on them and they stay together, you uh-huh, know, uh-huh. or like Legos. You're you've, I don't know. I'm like, I surely we could make a vulcanized rubber based kids toy. That would be really fun to play with. Yes. We're like one step away from it. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, but yes, I agree. It did feel kind of intuitive. And I did, I didn't explicitly say this, I don't think, but part of what happens when you stretch like a, a rubber band, for example, is those polymers come uncoiled. So like the necklaces stretch to their fullest, uh, yeah. but you're not able to really break the sulfur cross links. That's why it snaps back. Got it. Got it. Probably some of them start breaking once it loses its elasticity, but yeah. And then, um, there is a cool experiment you can do. I linked to, um, a scientific American article where they walked through this experiment, but it's essentially can expose a stretched out rubber band to heat and it'll shrink up. Ah, so that's kind of a fun one. Interesting. Okay. Are you, you did a good job explaining it. Are you ready for some fun facts? Oh yes. I'm ready. I love fun facts. Okay, so have I know you have heard of a latex allergy because your wife has one. Mm -hmm. Several people have latex allergies. Especially if they've been exposed to it a lot, like in the medical field. Mm -hmm. They and, just slowly be... Oh, do they? Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah. But here's what I do know. The allergy is actually in the proteins that are in the original latex serum. Okay. And when they are going through the manufacturing process, so they, I talked about how they treated it for... Um, bacteria they also try to wash it with water mm. so because most of the proteins are water soluble and that way they're able to try to get some of those proteins off so depending i read a whole paper from uh the journal if i think it was of allergy med allergy and oh i can't remember it's not one i normally use because you know i'm not an allergist or a doctor mm -hmm. or that kind of doctor i am a doctor yes you are a doctor i am yeah. a doctor um, but it was from the Journal of Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Whoa. And they talked about how different manufacturing processes will cause different types of latex to be more irritating to someone with a latex allergy. Because if they are, if they focus on removing the protein in their, their uh, manufacturing process, then because they've removed the protein, people will have less of an intense allergic reaction. Interesting. There's just less of the allergen in there. Yeah, yeah. Wow. So that, I thought that was a fun fact. And the other fun fact is, so I, w I was thinking actually that contraceptives, condoms made of latex, for some reason I thought that they were plastic. Huh. In my mind, I don't think I realized that I mean, they're called rubbers, I guess, but I don't think I realized that they were literally made of latex, which comes from a plant. Right. But um, the latex polymer, because it's relatively nonpolar, can easily be uh, dissolved by other nonpolar things. And that's why if you have a latex contraceptive and you have an oil-based lubrication, it will dissolve because similar uh -huh. things dissolve one another. Right. It will literally dissolve the latex of that contraceptive. Wow. I know. That's crazy. And a similar, but I guess more PG example of this is um, a lot of oranges have limonene or limonene. Uh -huh. That's like that orangey, good smelling oil that like comes out of the orange peel you can use that to pop a uh, latex balloon. Oh, interesting. Because it's also an oil. And ah. there's a whole video that I linked to on the American Chemical Society where she tries different oils uh -huh. to see if they can pop balloons. And then she got like a party balloon that was supposed to be made of like semi-vulcanized rubber. Uh -huh. That's where I said I wasn't sure how clear it was. Yeah. Is that like water balloons are not vulcanized at all, but I guess there's a level of vulcanization to like stronger balloons maybe. Okay, got it. Um, but they're harder to pop with oil. So she mm. tried to pop it at that one with the limonene. She was like, it shouldn't work. And it did take longer. And then it popped and she goes, well, I guess I got cheap party balloons. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I would think it would be eventually able to make a hole in them because, you know, there is still that polymer right, there. But right. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, that's nuts. Also, I good job talking about that topic while being really good at the vocab and the word choice. Thanks. That's going to go right over some and right <laughs> at the right level for others. For others. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, how can I talk about this in a way that yeah. children are going to be okay? Yep. Um, so that's it. Wow. That's cool. That's all I learned about rubber and latex. I just don't think I ever thought that like latex gloves and rubber tires were made from the same base thing. And also it's plant-based. Yeah. It's from a plant. Right. 
Yeah, it's crazy because I think uh, I think we all think of like so many of those types of materials being fully synthetic mm-hmm. or like real close to it, you know? like I just put it in the plastic bin. Yeah, full on like man-made. But it's like, oh no, this is, so much of this already just in nature, it just needs to be like yes. harnessed and tweaked and adjusted and whatever else. And then we get the super cool material that's super useful and awesome. And thank you, nature. Yeah. And I wondered, um, I'm assuming obviously you can dissolve the non-vulcanized rubber so that I would think that that's not like a forever type of plastic that takes oh, really long right. to break down. I think if you can dissolve it in oil, I think. Hmm. But then I was wondering, what about vulcanized rubber? Is that like harder to break down so it acts more like plastic in the environment? So I don't have answers to that. That's a question that I'm thinking about that Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to research before today's episode. And then the other thing I'm thinking about is looking into silicone and what that is as opposed to plastic. Yeah, They're all polymers, which is why it makes sense we put them in a similar bin, but some are nature-based and able to dissolve in oil and others are man-made or man-interfered. So, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So that's what you can expect to be coming up in the next few episodes, hopefully. I mean, it all depends on how many uh, really good resources I can get because I try not to make an episode unless I'm confident in the um, resources that they're peer reviewed or from a trustworthy source. Right. Right. Like the American Chemical Society, Royal Society of Chemistry and other peer reviewed journals are mostly what I focus on. Nice. So that's it. So now let's talk about a happy thing from this week. Sweet. I'm down. Do you have a happy thing you want to share? Sure. I've got one. So, you know, one thing that's nice actually right now in Texas, for some reason, the beginning of our summer has been milder, you know? Yeah. It's been pretty awesome. So May, we just had like, I think like two days that I remember where it, where it, um, surpassed 90 degrees outside Fahrenheit, um, which is like rare. I mean, honestly, mm-hmm. we get usually have a bunch of those in May. Yep. So we had that only twice that I can remember. Someone might correct me, but in, in general, still way more mild temperatures. Then even the, a couple of days in June have been kind of mild, which is interesting. But what's funny about that is we hadn't had our first like hangout in the pool. You know, we have a pool mm-hmm. and it's kind of, we have a love hate relationship with it, but <laughs> We hadn't had our first dip in the pool until we did that with you guys, mm-hmm. you and Mason, about a week uh, and a half ago or so, mm-hmm. which was super fun. And then last, this past weekend, we did our first hang on the pool with Em and I and both the kids yes. for the for this year. And so, so is that um, your younger child's first time to go swimming? First time swimming. Mm-hmm. <laughs> ah, that's yep. so exciting. That was fun. It was, it was pretty cold. The water hasn't really warmed up very much yet, but- it was a lot of fun mm-hmm. and our, our oldest, you know, he kind of remembers playing in the pool before, but he can do more things and yeah. he enjoys it more now and stuff. We just had a kind of fun family pool time oh, I love the other that. day and it was great. So that was my happy thing. That, yeah, the mildness of the summer, it has meant for less pool. Like one time I was going to get in the pool, it was really hot. And by the time I changed my swimsuit, came back out, it was raining. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yep. Yeah. It's happened like every day. We've had a lot of rain. Yes, we have. And yeah. actually my husband's family is from Amarillo and it's rained so much there that it's like been declared a disaster, I think technically, but they have relief coming in and wow. there's so much flooding that like whole streets of businesses have shut yeah. down. And they showed me a picture of, you can tell it's a street with a gutter and there are fish swimming in Oh my in gosh, it. that's crazy. It's wild. They're just infrastructures not used to that much water that mm-hmm. much, that quickly, that frequently. Wow, yeah. that's crazy. And they, similarly, I know that there's a lake in California. This is so wild to me. Oh yeah. But it used to not be a lake. Uh-huh. And they, they had drained out all the water and turned it into an agricultural center. Uh-huh. And now, because there's so much rainfall over the winter... And into the spring in California that it basically turned back into a lake and they're anticipating even more flooding and the water rising as a snowpack mounts. Wow. Which is crazy. Like the lake is like, I'm back. The lake's taking back its territory. Yeah. I'm back, dude. Well, and because we talked about that, my husband was like, oh, do you think Amarillo used to be a lake and that's why it's flooding? <laughs> I was like, who knows? Oh, God. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> so um, <laughs> it's been like a kind of nice in terms of weather, like two or three days I've been like, oh, it's really hot. And within hours, it's cloudy again yeah. that day. Yeah. But it's also kind of scary because we're 
our infrastructure is not designed for that. We've had a mm-hmm. lot of hail pretty late into the season. So yeah. Surprising. Yeah, definitely surprising. I saw somebody post a hail that was like bigger than their fist. Like wow. they were holding in their palm and it was like bigger than their palm. That was in uh, Argyle, which is a town like 20 yeah. minutes south of yeah. here. And obviously we're used to that big hail. Like some parts of the country don't get that near as bad, but yeah. Texas we do in the winds, the tornadoes, whatever else. But like usually it's like definitely done by now. Mm-hmm. And like we get some rainy Aprils and usually the first chunk of May might be rainy. But by the end of May, we're dry as a bone, you know? And so it's like very strange for this to <laughs> keep going on. And the frequency that yeah. it's happened. Yeah. Okay. Well, that was a tangent again. We're kind of tangential today, I guess. Whoops. Well, here's my fun fact. It's actually not a, it's kind of a fun fact. Uh-huh. It's actually more of like a help me. Okay. So I travel a lot for work uh-huh. and I've been trying not to check a bag because, you know, the less you can spin, the better. Totally. But I feel like my hair products take up a lot of space, like a hair dryer mm. or a curling wand. So even if I'm going to go curly, it's nice to have the diffuser, which fits on my hair dryer, you know, or if I want it to be more straight, I like to have a little body. So I'll do a little bit of wave. So I always have to bring some kind of hair tools. Uh-huh. But I recently learned from your wife about heatless curling. Oh, right. Where you like put a little tube on your head. Uh huh. And I've been doing that. So for those of you watching on YouTube today, there is a little, I used heatless curl in my hair. What's nice about it is I could sleep on my hair and then it looks pretty normal. Yep. A lot of times if I sleep on my hair, it's a whole thing to get yeah. styled the next day. Yeah. Um, and these clips that were very popular back in my day mm-hmm. are back, the claw clips. Uh-huh. And so I'm, I've been having fun kind of experimenting, seeing like, are there work appropriate hairstyles I could use without bringing a bunch of stuff? Totally. So for our listeners who are good at heatless styling or who have good tips and tricks, Mm -hmm. have hair tutorials they like, send them my way. Or maybe even some travel savvy folks or Mm -hmm. both, I guess, or whatever. They might have some tricks up their sleeve too. They might have some tricks. One thing I thought is I could probably bring my diffuser part and hope it fits on the hotel hair dryer. Mm. But who knows? Yeah. And I think for the, the conference I'm going to soon, we're actually staying in dorm rooms. So there won't be even a hotel hair dryer. Right. Dang it. So any tips and tricks y'all can give me. I've been having a lot of fun. It's it's also fun that these claw clips are back. I'm like, oh yeah, 1990. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. It's, maybe it's like 1997. But uh-huh. <laughs> um, I loved them in high school and I totally forgot about them. So yeah. I'd love any tips and tricks. That's been what I've been doing lately. That's a great idea. I mean, we get some really cool ideas from you guys and stuff like that in general, but about episodes, but yeah, putting a, putting a request out there. Yeah. That's a good idea. That's my request. Nice. I'm sure people have good tricks. We listen to a lot of people who like to solve things. So yes, yes. Awesome. Well, thanks for being excited about rubber and latex and the fact that it comes from a plant, which I was, I, I knew, but I, I didn't really know what that meant, you know? So it was a really fun journey and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. Well, thank you for teaching us. That was definitely cool. I did not, I mean, I guess I had a vague idea about plant involvement because of the rubber tree thing, but that's kind of all I knew really. So thank you for teaching us. That was awesome. Definitely. And if you out there have a question, idea, thought, something you think might be chemistry, please reach out to us. Let us know. We'd love to hear it. Reach out to us on our website. That is chemforyourlife.com. That's chem. F O R your life.com to share your thoughts and ideas. If you'd like to help us keep our show going and contribute to cover the cost of making it, go to patreon.com slash chem for your life or type the link in our show notes or the description of the video to join our super cool community of patrons. If you're not able to do that, you can still help us by subscribing on your favorite podcast app, um, reading and writing a review on Apple Podcasts, or subscribing on YouTube because that also helps us to share chemistry with even more people. And your review might get a shout out on one of the bonus episodes. That's right. This episode of Chemistry for Your Life was created by Melissa Collini and Jam Robinson. Jam Robinson is our producer. And this episode was made possible by our financial supporters on Patreon. It seriously means so much to us that you want to help make chemistry accessible to even more people. We cannot describe how thankful we are and how much that's allowed us to keep this show going. Those supporters are Abishai B, who helped come up with the idea for today's episode. Bree M, Brian K, Chris and Claire S, Chelsea B, Derek L, Emerson W, Hunter R, Jacob T, Christina G, Lynn S, Melissa P, Nicole C, Nellie S, Stephen B, Shadow, Suzanne S, Timothy P, and Venus R. Thank you again for everything you do to make Chemistry for Your Life happen. 
And if you'd like to learn more about today's chemistry lesson and check out some of the references that Melissa mentioned during the episode, you can look at those references in our show notes or in the description of the video. Yay, chemistry. Yay, chemistry. <laughs> I, was, I always feel like that needs to be filled in with something. <laughs>